Approximately 1.5 million people in the UK have a learning disability. 15% of these people have secure long-term tenancy or live in their own home. Until July 2006, 39-year-old Stephen Hoskin was one of this 15%. He lived in St Austell in Cornwall. On the 6th of July, his body was found at the base of the St Austell Railway Viaduct. Two people were found guilty of his murder. Darren Stewart, aged 29, and Sarah Bullock, aged 16. Martin Pollard, aged 21, was found guilty of manslaughter. Darren Stewart, the leader of this group, was already known to police for his criminal activities and for having complex, unmet needs of his own. He had targeted Stephen Hoskin because of his learning disabilities. Stephen desperately wanted friends and so accepted Darren Stewart and the group into his life and home without recognising the true exploitative nature of their friendship. Stephen's final hours of life were bleak in the extreme. He was tortured, forced to wear a dog lead, coerced into swallowing an overdose of paracetamol and then made to leave his home and walk to the railway viaducts near his house. Darren Stewart then made Stephen climb over the safety rail and Stephen was forced to let go and fall to his death as Sarah Bullock kicked his face and stood on his hands. Investigations uncovered the fact that Stephen had made several calls and visits to a number of agencies, all of which should have alerted people to the danger of his situation and his vulnerability. In 2000, the Department of Health and the Home Office produced a document called No Secrets. It was a guidance document, uh, guidance for social care. And the expectation was that agencies would work together to protect vulnerable adults. Um, I guess in 2008 and 2009, uh, following the uh, serious case review in Cornwall, the gains have been really quite substantial and Cornwall is doing all that the No Secrets document of 2000 aspired to do. Uh, it has taken a tragedy of this magnitude to promote uh, the partnership working uh, that is sought in that guidance. The Serious Case Review provided the opportunity to learn, to look at what went wrong, how improvements could be made and what's going right. It seemed to me that every agency had a small piece of information or even quite a large piece of information, but they looked at that information as though uh, it was disconnected from anything else. Um, and one of the principal findings of the Sears case review was that every agency had a piece of a jigsaw, but at no stage did they seek to discuss the piece that they held or the information or indeed the concerns that they had about Stephen's circumstances. I think each agency had such a strong sense of having failed a very vulnerable man. That's not to say that these agencies are entirely without merit or that they acted um, in a way that they, were, they knew of uh, the danger that Stephen was in. They, they did not see it coming. Um, so it had a, a very major impact on all services across sectors. It's a very tragic um, murder and I think people's initial reaction to that um, was one of great shock and, and sorrow. And I think that shock and sorrow still stays with us. But actually what it provided was a real catalyst for change. And I think the process that we've gone through in Cornwall following that murder um, has really been very positive in terms of basically taking safeguarding adults um, forward into a much better place than it was before. I think every agency in Cornwall moved on very swiftly from their painful self-scrutiny and thought, how can they make real safeguarding for adults in the county? So, for example, the police were required to read the serious case review and to think hard about neighbourhood uh, neighborhood policing and very specifically about problem-solving policing. The serious case review confirmed that police had been called to Blowing House Close on numerous occasions. Each time these were attended by different officers and seen as one-off events. 
The review has forced this issue to be addressed. We have just introduced what we're calling the Neighbourhood Harm Register, which looks at when we have repeat calls to the same people with the same problems. A few years ago, we didn't have that sort of structure, so we were going and dealing with the same incidents, not problem-solving them, and those incidents were going on and leaving people more vulnerable. Can I just confirm that's a disorder at one of our vulnerable repeat addresses? We have a mechanism where every week a station inspector will ask his team what problems are they having at what addresses and what are we doing about problem-solving it in partnership with our other agencies here in Cornwall. The fact that it goes down to a neighbourhood beat team level gives personal ownership at a constable level to find the solutions. Similarly, the ambulance service, which had not been um, able to deliver what's called a, a management review report to the uh, serious case review, undertook to do that, even though the review had delivered its findings, undertook to do that in the 12 months after um, the uh, review was published and to learn the lessons. The serious case review prompted Southwestern Ambulance Services to question why they had not picked up on the number of repeat call-outs to Blowing House Close. What we realised when we analysed the, the case of um, the attendance at Stephen Hoskins' address was that we'd been on numerous occasions. None of those individual incidents had raised enough concern to trigger an alert. The emergency. Thank you. What's the problem? Tell me exactly what's happened. Is that from another fall? Or is We're much better now at looking at that in the context of a cluster of calls. As the series case review pointed out, Stephen's repeat use of NHS primary and secondary care services should have made him more visible to them. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Before the Stephen Hoskins case, we had no way of knowing whether somebody had attended um, one, two, three, maybe four times into one of our minor injuries, and we also couldn't identify if they'd attended different minor injuries. Take a seat on the trolley there for me. Since the Stephen Hoskins case, we've implemented the computerised system, which also has set triggers. The triggers are that if, obviously, if the nurse is concerned at the time, they can trigger that and can actually phone our unit and tell us. Um, if somebody attends three times in one month, three times in three months, or six times in six months, that automatically is notified to us by the computerised system. We're also starting to share information with the South West Ambulance Trust. This was self-inflicted. Is it still in his arm at the moment? OK. It's still there, then do not pull it out, OK? If anything does get worse or change, I need you to call us straight back on 999 for the ambulance on its way. They're actually sending through to the Safeguarding Children and Adults team the addresses that they've been called out to more than three times in a month, and we're cross-referencing those with the, our own minor injuries alerts to see if any of them yeah. are the same. They've, uh, they have reports of him. Have you got the name flagged? What's your log number for that one? We're also cross-referencing them with people who are known to be vulnerable adults with the information that's shared with us from the Department of Adult Social Care. So I'm really very pleased with the amount of progress we've made with sharing information. We've still got a way to go. Um, we are still meeting with other agencies such as the police to see if there's any way in which we can sh all share um, the information that we all are gathering around vulnerable adults and addresses where vulnerable adults may live. Stephen's accommodation at Blowing House Close had been secured by adult social care. They set up a plan to include weekly visits to his home, but in August 2005, Stephen chose to discontinue his community care assistance support. A serious case review questions why this choice was not investigated or explored. After the Stephen Hoskins case, um, people felt very shocked and very, very disappointed. Um, it was also on top of a previous inquiry that we'd had in Cornwall around learning disability services. So I think that the whole thing just impacted on a sense of failure in the department. Things have improved vastly since the Stephen Hoskins case. You know, staff are trained now in a way that they, they weren't before. We've got processes in place, we've got leads. I think, I'd like to think that there's nobody that works for the department that isn't aware now of safeguarding systems and alerts and what you do with alerts. I think there's a much greater likelihood 
um, that somebody uh, with Stephen Hoskins' support needs would be identified now in Cornwall. Um, the, each of the agencies has gone way beyond the minimal adjustment that you could say an action plan is about. They've hit all the actions. That's good. They've gone beyond that. In the serious case review, Margaret Flynn used the metaphor of pieces of a jigsaw and the fact that those pieces of the jigsaw weren't being put together. And when we're doing work in relation to safeguarding adults, then vulnerable adults' lives are complex and they touch a wide range of agencies. And if you want to know what's happening with that person's life, then you actually need to work with a wide range of agencies to put those pieces together so that you can see the picture, so that you can take action before the tragedy occurs, rather than picking up those pieces after it has occurred. And I think that a lot of the work we've done in Cornwall since that review has been part of trying to ensure that agencies do work much more closely together and do share that information so that actually we can start to see that um, picture emerging in time to take action. And if other areas can learn those lessons without having to go through the same tragedy we went through here, then that's obviously very positive. <laughs>